Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. A lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. In the name of the Blessed Trinity, one holy and living God. Amen. Please be seated. I want to, uh, I want to start out with a content warning. Um, I'm going to be talking about my personal, my personal experience with being part of a neighborhood association. <laughs> and I don't want to trigger anyone. <laughs> and I'm doing so a little, a little tongue in cheek, as you can, as you can tell, um, with the understanding that not all are the same. Okay, so I do know that. And when common land is involved, like lake access or something like that, uh, formal or legal guidance is indeed necessary. Okay, so I understand this. Um, but what I didn't know 25 years ago when we first bought this house, what I didn't know 25 years ago, um, and what I really learned only just last year after reading Ark of Justice by Kevin Boyle, and I have that book on the information table, by the way, a must read. Um, so what I learned in this book is that neighborhood associations initially started popping up as another form of redlining, the legalized prohibiting of home ownership for people of color. And I'm sharing this with you because we can't do better unless we know better. So keep learning, dear faithful. It's the work of being anti-racist. It's the work of loving our neighbors as ourselves. So, okay, 
So that's the content warning. The parable of the Good Samaritan is one that most of us can recite in our sleep. We know the characters and we know the moral of the story. We have Good Samaritan laws woven into our secular code of conduct, which is ironic given the point Jesus is trying to make, but I will get to that in a moment. We may even know some of the background and history of the story as well, like how the road to Jerusalem and Jericho was fraught with danger and that Samaritans and the Jews were enemies or at least unfriendlies. And we know the structure of the parable and how it is brilliantly told and we know of each twist in its telling. A man gets beaten and robbed and lays naked, helpless, and dying on the side of the road. When along come two clerics, two clergy members, one after the other, who ignore the victim. And by doing so, they set up the heroic behavior of the third person. But plot twist, this third person isn't the good clergy that we expect in the rule of three of storytelling. He's a Samaritan, the enemy, the other, now defined as neighbor, not by his social location, but by his behavior, his acts of compassion and mercy. A twist in the story. But we know all of this, right? We know this and we get the point, so we confidently, like pinky swear to God, that if anyone lay dying in the road, we will not be the one who put them there. <laughs> and, and we will indeed help them. We will help them. We've evolved as a people, Lord, we insist. We're Christians now. We'll be a neighbor to anyone, regardless of gender, race, creed, sexual orientation, gender expression, age, ability, the uniform they are wearing, their economic circumstances, or even their political affiliation. But... <laughs> wanting to justify our propensity for violence and hardness of heart, we are now asking Jesus with frightening regularity, what if the loss of life is worth it? Twist. This parable goes so much deeper than a call to be a neighbor to someone who is wounded and already in our sphere of daily interactions. In its telling, Jesus provides a way for us to end the violence which put the traveler on the side of the road half dead in the first place. But in order to get to that end, we need to be keenly aware, keenly aware that as Christians, and especially those of us who come from privilege and the dominant culture, we are not any of the characters in the parable. We are the lawyer that Jesus is addressing. Now, let me be clear, let me be clear that the lawyer, the lawyer is not the villain in this text, not the villain. <laughs> This is not the parable of the bad lawyer, okay? Yes, he was testing Jesus, but that's what you did. That's what you did in order to determine the credibility of the teacher. Was Jesus someone worth following? Curious minds want to know, right? And what the lawyer struggled with is what most of us struggle with, the knowledge that if you follow Jesus, you have to be all in. Love God, love neighbor, no exceptions. No exceptions. So the lawyer isn't bad, the lawyer is very human. And in fact, the lawyer is the only one in this gospel reading able to change the trajectory 
of the greater narrative and make a difference. Go and do likewise, he is told. Be a neighbor. It's the only way the world is going to change. We are the lawyer, and the lawyer has options. But we also have the same human limitations, so it's helpful to keep in mind the questions Jesus is answering with this parable. How do I inherit eternal life, and who is my neighbor? Like the lawyer, Christianity has had centuries to ponder these questions. And also like the lawyer, we know how to recite the correct answers. But we are often caught justifying our behavior and making excuses for not loving God fully and not loving all of our neighbors as ourselves or even at all. And that is partly a failure of imagination due to an overwhelming sense of, of helplessness, of helplessness in an increasingly hostile world. So let me focus on a specific neighborhood in order to expand on how to actually neighbor. So moving back here from New York, where we were in the process of looking at houses, you know, online, because we couldn't go in them. Thanks, COVID. Um, but, but Blaine and I each had our own set of criteria. Like, we had our lists, right, of what we were looking for. But one thing, you know, and they didn't always match. But one, one thing that both of us agreed on strongly is that we were never living in a neighborhood association again. Now, this impersonal yet well-defined entity which governed our family habitation was honestly really no more than an annoyance for us. I mean, they hadn't, I mean, it was just annoying. And, and I get that they're at their ideological best. Neighborhood associations can create community by agreeing to some guiding principles or rules about how we are going to live together. And if you are unfamiliar, this code of conduct or rules um, are all written out in what is known as the association bylaws. And, and there is nothing wrong with this. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with this. I love structure. <laughs> no to anarchy, I say, no. <laughs> okay, so, and, and a certain group of wandering Israelites required the same sort of, you know, help, right, on how they were going to live together. And sometimes, actually, I'm convinced that whoever wrote our association bylaws also wrote Leviticus. <laughs> Thou shalt not hang thy laundry out to dry. It is an abomination. <laughs> Thou shalt not plant fruit-bearing trees, for they messeth up the walkways. Thou shalt not adorn the exterior of your dwelling with the colors of other gods. <laughs> and once a year thou shalt make an offering of paper and of ink to the association gods who will find favor upon you and remove the snow from your driveway and from your walkways. Amen, hallelujah. Okay, I exaggerate. A little. <laughs> A little. These are actually all things. <laughs> and this is not, you know, and again, this is not meant to be a universal truth. I am simply using my experience to point out how sometimes, with the best of intentions, we try to codify what neighbor means. And, and sometimes that works out. But my experience is that instead of creating a sense of of community, the association was used as a means of arbitration, and the bylaws became a way of bypassing communication and relationship with the neighbors altogether. 
and this can lead to all kinds of contention. Imagine that. Imagine that. The very laws that were established to create community are being used as divisive tools. Huh. Anyway. Anyway, you may be wondering why. Why, if I thought so poorly of the Neighborhood Association, did we continue to live there? I mean, we actually, okay, privileged, had the option to move. We had the means and ability to do that. But, but we didn't. Because, put simply, we loved our neighbors. They were the best. They were wonderful. They came over in the middle of the night to be with our kids so Blaine and I could take my mother to the ER. The neighbor across the street had generously taken upon herself to outfit our only daughter with the clothes that her only daughter had outgrown. For 10 years, I never had to buy Tessa a coat. All right, that's a big deal. Our neighbors actively prayed for me and supported our family during my entire ordination process. Truly I tell you, truly I tell you, you cannot legislate that kind of community. And yet, that is exactly the kind of community required to dissipate hate. And the good news is we can be that. We can be that. We are, in fact, being that. You see, the association had no role in how we were neighbors to one another. That happened. That happened out of conversations at the bus stop, in the backyards, and over the bread and wine shared with new families when they moved in. It happened through our children who, thanks be to God, care about social location and artificial boundaries just as little as Jesus did. We first met our neighbors that we frequently traveled with on vacation. That's how much we loved them and got along. We traveled with them on vacation when their then young son came trotting across the street and two backyards to get to the toys on our deck, like next to the house. No boundaries. <laughs> it was the little ones, not the law, that brought us together. Gasp, <laughs> right? Uh, rules may structure a community, but they do not create one. Let me say that again. Rules may structure a community, but they do not create one. That is our responsibility. Community is created out of a willingness to be in relationship with one another, a willingness to risk eye contact with each other, to risk intimacy and vulnerability, to risk not just welcoming the stranger, but risk being one. We have to have experiences beyond our own backyard and worldview in order to empathize and offer anything useful to those in need. To use the metaphor of my old neighborhood again, we can't pretend that our fit in or get find normative landscaping and invisible fences are any less shocking than any other walls we try to build as an excuse not to be a neighbor. Living in community with God and one another is as simple as this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. That's it. That's it. It isn't complicated. We shouldn't need a big book of rules and definitions to accompany it. In fact, any further codification of this law is simply us trying to justify our lack of obedience to God.
Yeah, we understand the point of the parable. That's why it's so hard, because we get it. Neighbor is now a verb, not a social location. No exceptions, no excuses. So let us go and do likewise. Amen.